Hey guys, thank you so much for watching my videos. I really appreciate it and I've definitely noticed an uptick in viewership and subscriptions. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to let you know that this video you're about to see has been recorded over a period of days and some of the time frames you might hear a little bit later in the video may be a little off as a result of that, but the information still remains the same. Also, I did script it to make sure that I covered all the things that I wanted to cover. So if it sounds a little weird, that's why. But but uh, I hope you get some really good information out of this and uh, let's get into it. Hey everyone, Fox Hunter here and I thought now that I finally have my beautiful Great One Red Deer in the lodge, I would do a video about some of the tweaks to Scarecrow's herd management method that I made that I think helped earn me my Great One, as well as several diamonds. Now I want to preface this with a few things. A, prior to starting the herd management method, I was hunting red deer all willy-nilly across multiple maps since about January of 2022. That includes Park Fernando, Quattro Carolinas, Teo Aurora, and this resulted in hundreds if not thousands of kills before I started the herd management process. I think in the video featuring my melanistic red deer, I mentioned two to 3,000 kills and that's where that comes from. I don't know how much that plays into getting my great one, but I can tell you Doing that did not produce the type of successes or results I've seen in recent weeks. So if you're looking to seriously grind, I highly believe the herd management method is the way to go. B, I started herd management about two weeks ago, a full week before I started recording again. That got me well on my way to grooming my zones the way Scarecrow's video suggested. I posted my grand return video on November 7th and I started playing in earnest several weeks before that, after I got back from my honeymoon. Yay! I spent a lot of time on Park Fernando on multiplayer servers before I really got serious about the herd management technique, which was around November 1st. With that being said, and without further ado, here are the techniques I used and the things I observed, which I felt helped me be successful while practicing herd management. One, do your research. There are plenty of other YouTubers out there besides me, who have been doing this a long time and they've dedicated themselves to cracking the code of spawning diamonds, rares, super rares, and great ones. Two, never underestimate a good tripod or tree stand. For the longest time, I wasn't using them at all and using other herd animals like fallow deer or bison or whatever to help remove hunting pressure after need zones had concluded. It's inefficient, though it does get you more money. Three, I allowed myself one grounded shot per zone. This means that if I climbed down from a tree stand or a tripod and a big animal ran by, I allowed myself to take it from the ground. It was still easy to remove hunting pressure, but shooting more than one using this method makes it a lot harder, so use this trick wisely. Four, use the same colored stand or tent every time. Buying tents and stands of multiple colors is a newbie mistake and one that I've made myself. Tents and stands are some of the heaviest objects in the game and you have to clear a lot of inventory to carry them. Buying tents and stands of the same color, however, allows you, you to stack them in your inventory, which does not count against your weight limit. For example, you can have 13 of the camo tents in storage and in your inventory, and because they're the same color, you can carry as many as you want. Five, pick up your mythicals and legendaries. It's highly recommended that you pick up all of your harvested animals because if you use the time reset option and you're purchasing hunting stands and tents and taxidermizing all your big boys, you will run out of money. I know, I did. Several times. But if nothing else, make sure you pick up the big boys. And I don't know if the game keeps a record of your harvest and has a system where the more high level golds and diamonds you have, the better chances of spawning a great one happens, but you know, anything's possible. Six, use the login logout technique at the end of each rotation. This one is simple. Once you reset your time to start your next rotation, log out completely from the game to your desktop and log back in. That helps bring respawns back to your map. You can also do this occasionally during your rotation. I did that a few times and did notice a difference. Seven, pick a start time that works best for you. Most YouTubers I've seen recommend starting about 30 minutes to an hour after your need zones have started so that all animals are in their zones. For red deer, drink time is usually 6 or 6.30 to 10 or 10.30, so that would mean a 7 or 7.30 rotation start time. 
I, however, started my rotations between 8.05 and 8.20 because I believe some of the largest animals don't appear until much later in the drink time. I talk a little bit more about this later when I discuss floating spawns. 8. Pick a familiar rotation and try not to deviate too much from it. Mine was a spiral, started from the northwesternmost lake and rounded around to the right until I got to my purge zone, as I'm showing you on the screen. I'll explain what a purge zone is in a moment, but in order to explain that and how I think it worked on Tio Awara, I need to explain three other theories I've had about need zones. Sine wave respawning, redistribution spawning, and floating spawns. So what is sine wave respawning? To start, a sine wave is a waveform with high peaks and low troughs, kind of like how ocean waves work. They're cyclical and they repeat over and over. Have you ever been completing your rotations and noticed that your zones may start out having a quite few mid-grade animals, like fives, sixes, that sort of thing? But then as you complete each rotation, you notice bigger and better animals respawn until you reach a peak where maybe you have an abundant amount of high level sevens, eights, maybe even a nine or two. Then when you take out all those big ones, the next rotation has a higher concentration of lower mid level animals in your zones and you have to build back up again. I was noticing this as I was doing my grind and it may be how I have my map set up, but my theory is that spawning in the game may actually come in waves, much like I described above. I feel like there's some credence to this because if you've ever been around a hacker who does any sort of spawn bombing, that's where they spawn in a group of animals, you'll notice it's generally a crowd of different species. I've noticed as they spawn bomb, the quality of the animal seems to go up with each one they do. Uh, incidentally, you'll also want to avoid these people like the plague if you want legitimate great ones, diamonds, rares, that sort of thing. I still think Call of the Wild operates using a random number generator, or RNG as it's known in the community, but what if the RNG has some sort of algorithm that incrementally increases the size and quality of your spawns just to keep you engaged as a hunter, then drops sharply when you peak so you have to do it over again? It makes sense to me because as you increase in level as a hunter, the system would likely be programmed to keep pace with you in your skill set to provide a dynamic hunting experience. That's another reason to pick up your mythicals and legendaries and use those skill and perk points. The other theory is spawn redistribution. This relies on both the RNG system and a version of sign respawning. It's basically the idea that as you go through your rotation, your kills randomly respawn in other need zones as higher levels. For example, if you kill a level 5 on a lake on the western part of your map, it will respawn maybe as a level 6 or 7 in an open slot in another need zone on another lake or river, most likely one you have not hunted at yet or with low hunting pressure in that same rotation. I saw some evidence of this as I was doing my rotations because it seemed like my higher level numbers, especially my 7s, were redistributing across the map ahead of me as I culled them from my zones. So my last theory was the floating spawn theory. And these are usually your highest ranking animals, anything from a mythical and above, that are not bound to any one herd or need zone. You usually see them casually strolling in af long after a need zone has started, or maybe they only appear toward the end of the need zone time. These animals usually break away from a herd once you spook them and don't necessarily follow the same paths of entry or retreat. This is also why they are frequently spotted standing off by themselves or completely alone. I firmly believe in this theory because I've seen it in practice, and I will demonstrate it in a later video. And here's an example of a big boy arriving fashionably late. These guys have been here for a while, and he just sauntered in, and here comes another one. All mythical and stuff. But this is what I've been talking about with coming into your drink zones at later times. Because these big boys tend to do that. They tend to hang out a little bit later, especially these floater ones. You'll notice that if this isn't proof of my floater theory or my floating spawn theory, I don't know what is. Because you'll notice this one is not associated with any one herd. I've already got herds stationed at their usual points. Got one there. We've got my two across the way. They've got some smaller boys that I intend to take out. But that mythical is probably going to drop down into one of these. But otherwise, he's by himself. Back there on the hillside, he's in the tree line now, but I can't wait to see where he ends up because if, like I said, if that's not proof of the floating spawn theory, 
I don't know what is. But we'll see. So our fashionably late mythical ended up settling in the zone on the far side of the lake. And I know from earlier that the only boys that were in there was this five, this four, and this four. This four and this six. Which I think this is a shared need zone with two herds. So, and then of course, this, uh, where is he? Here we go. Where's your friend? Oh, I didn't go down far enough. <laughs> and of course, this big boy showed up much later for this side as well. So, again, that floating spawn theory definitely has some meat to it. Because of these higher level animals that I usually started my rotations later than most YouTubers would recommend. I firmly believe my great one was one of these floating spawns, but there's also a second male that sometimes appears with that particular herd, so maybe it was that, but it, it was one or the other, I'm pretty sure. Now, whether or not it's one of these theories are all in play in the game, or maybe even none of them, but they both helped inform me of my next technique, which was my purge zone. So my purge zone was the one need zone, or in this case, a set of need zones, where I called everything on four legs at the end of my rotation. To quote a friend of mine, if it's brown, it's down. And she's a avid hunter, so. On my Tio Awara map, it was the riverfront zones right in the middle of the map because it seemed like those need zones do not relocate if over harvested. They may just disappear and reappear, but it doesn't seem like they go anywhere else. I have another theory about need zones called zone seeding, and this is the idea that need zones only move within a given radius when you do over harvest them, but that's a video for another time. Now, because animals spook when you shoot at them, and you are limited by ammo capacity and reload time, there were usually one to four animals that would survive this need zone purge, and that's okay. This zone yielded the most funding and some of the largest animals on my map. If the sign spawn and or redistribution theories are true, then by completing your rotation, you basically push all of those high levels into one spot and then purge them completely. By this time, your other lakes across the map should have had time to recover and lose hunting pressure. And by doing this mass purge, you redistribute the spawns all across the map. And as you rotate, you rinse and repeat. I have been attempting to prove these ideas and theories for the last two days, and so far the results seem promising. Uh, since my great one, I've harvested 11 diamonds, and those were eight of the big racks, one I did not save because of my poor aim, and it was a gold. I should have saved it anyway, and I regret not having done that. Uh, I also got two of the small racks, which I didn't save because, again, I really don't like that rack style at all. But I did get one split rack, which you can see on the screen, and it's pretty awesome. It does kind of demonstrate why I like the one side versus the other. I mean, I just, I have a preference, and that's okay. And uh, I also ended up spawning one small piebald, which I'm hoping will become another Mela, or something. I do love the piebalds, though. So, uh, so far it's been going pretty well. Um, I'll post an update video after I've satisfied my curiosity about these ideas and theories I have. And again, they may not be true. I mean, there's a lot of other YouTubers out there who've also been playing a really long time who have noticed things. Maybe it is just an RNG and that's pure and simple and I'm overthinking it. But based on the preponderance of evidence, however, I really do feel there is some merit to these thoughts I have. Um, I also hope to spawn another great one as quickly as possible, and I think that will give me some more answers. Uh, the other thing is, I also intend to get back into some regular hunting other than red deer soon, because it does get kind of tedious doing this over and over again. But we'll get there. So I hope wa by watching this video, you glean some insights into setting up your great one grind. Um, again, I highly recommend you check out people like Scarecrow, uh, they posted the original herd management stuff, and that's what got me started on it. And I know he's updated his techniques since he initially posted about it, so please go check those out. Um, and also, there's plenty of other YouTubers you can subscribe to and listen to their techniques. And maybe a combination of things will help you get your goals and, and help improve your hunts and make them more exciting. But I really appreciate all y'all... Uh, 
coming and viewing my channel and coming along on my adventures with me. I have noticed an uptick in viewership and subscribers. So thank you. Thank you so much. That just encourages me to continue creating content. It really means a lot. Also, if you're new and you're just discovering my channel, please consider dropping a like and subscribing below. You can also ring the bell for when new content drops and join me casually. I don't mind. I'm happy to have you. But otherwise, I will catch you on our next adventure. Bye.